Alright gang, now that we've talked about rearrangements and how to make ethers, the last video in this series is going to talk about how we make a functional group called epoxides, right, epoxide synthesis. Here's what an epoxide is. If I'm going to draw you the generic functional group, because this is something that's new to us, you know, what you're going to have is you have a three carbon, or sorry, you have basically a little three, uh, three atom cyclic ether, right, you're going to have two carbons, and they'll both be bonded to the same oxygen. This is what an epoxide is. So let me draw you some examples. This would be an epoxide. This would be a one, two, three carbon epoxide. You can have epoxides with stereochemistry. So let me draw you an epoxide with cyclohexane ring. Right? We could do it with two wedges. Right? So you can see the epoxide kind of system would be this carbon right here, this carbon right there, and then the oxygen that makes it a cyclic ether. To kind of give you another cyclic, uh, well, another example of an epoxide, if we had a five-membered ring, and I had, it doesn't matter if they're wedges or dashes, they could be either, right? Again, we have a three-atom cyclic ether. Carbon here, carbon there, and the oxygen that bridges the gap and makes it a cyclic ether. Okay, so I'm gonna, there's one reaction to make epoxides, but I wanna lump that in with alkenes because it's kind of an alkene reaction. But this video is going to cover how we're gonna do nucleophilic attack with epoxides, right? We're gonna have nucleophiles and we're gonna attack these suckers and I wanna show you how we do that. And the reason why this is kind of a video dedicated for this is that you can attack epoxides in acidic environments and in basic environments and depending on which one you have, your regiochemistry will change, right? And by regiochemistry, I mean where you're actually going to attach uh, organic pieces together, right? Where you're actually going to attack. That will change based on whether you're in an acid environment or a base environment. Okay, so let me erase this and we're first going to tackle the acidic case. Okay, gang. So let's look at attacking this given epoxide um, off of a six-membered ring with uh, water in an acidic environment. So here's your tip off that you're in an acidic environment. You'll either see water or H plus or instead of this combination you'll see H3O plus which signifies the exact same thing, right? Because hydronium is essentially what well, is water with an extra proton on it, right? So I just want to make it very clear these are complementary, they are equivalent kind of uh, reagents. Okay, but here's how the mechanism t kind of goes with acid, uh, an acidic environment when dealing with an epoxide. So let me draw the mechanism down here in blue. So your very first step is to take your epoxide and nothing special going on here because we are symmetrical, right? Everything is, doesn't matter if attack happens here or here. But your first step is to protonate your epoxide. And at one, one point I really want to drive home is that when in acidic environments, your mechanisms only have positive charges, right? So we should never see a negative charge when we're working in an acidic environment with epoxides. So if we protonate this epoxide, here's kind of what we get. We get the protonated oxygen right here. And in future epoxide reactions, you'll have to do something like this. Can't you see I can draw some resonance if I draw a double-headed arrow? Here's what I can do. If I take this wedge and I swing the electrons onto the oxygen, I can... This carbon becomes a carbocation, right? And this carbon right here just has a wedged OH off of it. See how that works? At the same time, if I erase this arrow, let's say I draw another resonance structure. Let's say if I'm going to draw my other resonance structure down here. What if I took this wedge and dumped those electrons onto that oxygen? Then I get a resonance structure where I have something like this. The carbocation is up here, 
and now I have the alcohol down there, right? So you can see that when you have an epoxide in an acidic environment, your first step is to protonate your oxygen in the epoxide, and there's resonance to be drawn. However, we're symmetrical here, right? So we have the same resonance structure. So what I'm going to do, keep these in mind, but I'm going to continue the mechanism in blue, okay? So here's what's going to happen. We're going to have water come in. He's going to come along, and he's going to attack from the, the back side. This is SN2. So can't you guys see that if we have these wedges, right? These are coming out of the board kind of like this. Attack has to happen from the underside of the ring, right? We have to attack with this water, and when we attach this oxygen, it's going to be a dash, right? So it doesn't matter which carbon I attack, I'm just using to attack this top one. But when attack occurs, right, I'm coming from underneath the ring, and I'm going to bounce these wedge electrons onto this oxygen. So if I'm going to kind of draw the result of this electron flow up here, I now have just the wedged OH on the bottom carbon down here. And on this top carbon up here, I have a dashed oxygen with two protons on it, two hydrogens, right? Okay. As a cleanup step, I'm just going to have some water come along and grab this hydrogen. And the final product looks like this. And I'll draw it in black. And I'll rehash this really quickly. Okay, so remember, we have an epoxide in an acidic environment. The first step is to protonate that oxygen in the epoxide. Once you've done that, you can draw a little resonance, which co will come into play in the next reaction we do. But you can see that you take your nucleophile and you attack a carbon in the epoxide from the opposite side. So I have wedges here, so this o oxygen is attached as a dash. If I had two dashes, I would be attached as a wedge. And I did a little cleanup step, and there's our final product. Okay, now I'm going to erase this and do another, actually, you know what? We'll just erase this. No need to pause the video. And I'm going to show you guys what happens when you have an asymmetric epoxide, because the resonance is a factor. So I need to dust this eraser a little bit. Okay, so same reaction. But let's just say I put a methyl group right here. Now, how does this change? Okay? And I'm going to do this in black. Draw the whole mechanism down here. So, our first step is protonate the epoxide oxygen. Draw the methyl group. So, let's just say in this step right here, I protonate the oxygen just save me some space, right? Now, this oxygen has a plus one formal charge. So, let's draw some resonance. I'm gonna draw some resonance up here, and I'm gonna draw some resonance down here. So the first move I'm gonna make is I'm gonna take this wedge, and I'm gonna swing these electrons up onto that oxygen. So here's my carbocation intermediate I would form. I didn't touch the CH3 group. I now just have the wedged OH on this top carbon, right? And this bottom carbon down here lost the bond, so now he has a plus one formal charge. Now if I kind of erase this arrow, let's say I did it the other way around. Let's say I took this wedge and I bounced the electrons onto the oxygen. So what that would give me instead is now I have the OH on the bottom carbon, right? And up top, I have a carbocation. And since we know that carbocations are sp2 hybridized, right? If I'm going to draw this accurately, I just have a straight line for my methyl group, right? Okay, here's why the resonance is important. You have to look to see where the most stable carbocation is, right? See how this cation is tertiary, 
versus this cation being secondary. So this carbocation is a bigger resonance contributor to the overall hybrid, right? So if you can kind of understand that logic, in an acidic environment, you have to look for where the most stable carbocation is. That's what the structure looks most like at any given time. That's the carbon you attack. If that makes sense? So let me erase this resonance and I'll kind of explain it to you from like the reaction, from the blank reaction standpoint. So if I'm looking at this, I'm saying, okay, I'm in an acidic environment. I need to find where the more stable carbocation is. This would be a secondary carbocation. This would be a tertiary. This is the carbon I'm going to attack. That's how that works. So once you've protonated your oxygen in the epoxide, what you do then is you bring your nucleophile into play. Right? So I know I'm attacking this carbon right here. So I'm going to draw an arrow to attack. Here's the weird part. Right? Our leaving group is this wedge attached to the oxygen, right? So he's going to leave. So again, attack is still coming from the back side, even though there's a dashed methyl group. Here's what kind of happens. Right, if I redraw my ring, I have the wedge OH on the bottom carbon. Because this water attacked from the back side because this was a wedge, he's dashed. And as a result of that, this methyl group flips up to a wedge. A little weird, but that's how that works. Okay, all we need to do to finish this off Actually, I'll just do this, is to have some water or something else. He's going to help to deprotonate this oxygen by grabbing this proton, and we're going to dump these electrons onto that oxygen right there we just put on. So overall, here is our final product. Right, We have the wedged OH down here. That was a part of our original epoxide. We then have the wedged methyl group, which got flipped up. And I'm going to go through this again. And then we have the dashed OH. Okay, so remember, in an acidic environment, you have to look at your epoxide and say, okay, I know that I'm going to protonate this oxygen, and I have to look for which carbon will be the most stable carbocation. He's the one that's going to be, you know, most susceptible to nucleophilic attack because in the resonance hybrid, the structure will look most like that because it's more stable. You would then have to look, okay, secondary carbocation, aha, he is tertiary. He's the carbon I'm going to attack. You then protonate your oxygen, and then grab your nucleophile. It could be water, it could be an alcohol like methanol, ethanol, something like that. You then attack that carbon and then break the, uh, the bond to the epoxide oxygen. That's your leaving group. You have to then determine, okay, is, my, is this a wedge or a dash? Because that determines where your nucleophile is coming from. Since this is a wedge to our epoxide oxygen, this water is coming in from the, uh, the underside of the ring, he's going to be a dash. Whatever group is dashed, this methyl group in this case, he's going to flip up to a wedge, as you can see here. right? There's the epoxide oxygen, there's our wedged methyl group, and then there's our dashed nucleophile we just added clean them up with a quick acid-base reaction, there's your product. The acidic case is a little weird. Luckily, the basic case, much more simple. It's quite basic. Um, so let me erase this. We'll do the basic environment and how you attack epoxides in that way, and then I'll let you loose on the worksheet. Okay, gang. Now let's handle the attack in a basic environment. So here we are with the same exact reactant as we just did in the last problem, when we attacked in an acidic environment. Now the difference between these two is that you have plus charges in your acid environment and you only have negative charges in your basic environment. And like we talked about what your tip off is over the arrow, when you see, okay, I have an epoxide, which environment am I in? Well, if you see anything with a negative charge, you're definitely going to have attack in a basic environment, okay? It can be an OH minus. It could be, you know, something like, ethoxide, some type of alkoxide, anything like that. 
Okay, so I know the acidic environment was wonky because you're looking for the carbon that's the most stable carbocation, and if you noticed, it was the one that was more sterically hindered. However, the basic environment is a little more intuitive in my mind because you're looking for the carbon that is least sterically hindered. So, if I'm going to draw you this mechanism below, there's no protonation, right? Because we're not dealing with positive charges in this mechanism. This mechanism is definitely shorter. I, I promise you it is more intuitive. Here's kind of what it looks like. Sorry, I don't draw the best wedges. Okay, so hydroxide is definitely our nucleophile, right? Reactive, he's ready to go. So, again, this comes down to sterics in a basic environment. So, are we going to attack this tertiary carbon or this secondary carbon? Hopefully, you guys are like, obviously the secondary carbon. He's, least steric he's less sterically hindered, easier for this hydroxide to go in and attack. So, here are the arrows. We go in, we're going to attack from the bottom side, right? Because this is a wedge, so this hydroxide is going to be a dash. While that's happening, this wedge has to break, right? Otherwise, we'll violate the octet rule. So the result of that electron flow looks like this. So now on this bottom carbon, I have a dashed hydroxide. That's the one we just added. I still have my dashed CH3. I didn't touch him at all. And now I have this wedged O-. Right, because he got kicked off, he took on an extra electron pair. He is an O, whoops, that was ugly. He is an O minus. Okay, so we're almost done. We just have to clean him up, and this mechanism is over. So H2O is going to kind of be our source of H plus in this scenario. So let me just draw him out. Little cleanup step, just like that. And if we're going to draw an arrow up, here is our product, right? We have that dashed OH that we added through the SN2 attack on the less sterically hindered carbon that was a part of the epoxide. And, right, we didn't touch that dashed CH3 at all. We didn't have to. And now we have that wedged OH. Okay, so that's kind of the game we play with epoxides. In the acidic environment, you're looking for most stable carbocation, right? And for the basic environment, you're looking for less, or I should say least steric, hinder, well, steric hindrance. Okay? So, you don't always have to draw the mechanism, right? You especially don't have to show this cleanup step. That's kind of annoying. But just look at your epoxide and say, ah, you know, acid, I'm going to look for that, you know, carbon that's going to be the most stable carbocation, and in the basic environment, we're going to look for the best sterics. Best sterics meaning the least uh, steric hindrance. Okay, gang, I have a bunch of problems where I have you complete the reaction and draw the mechanism on this. I think you can handle it. I don't think we need to do any more here. So finish that last worksheet on epoxides, and then we're going to get into my favorite unit in OCHEM 1. It deals with alkenes. There's a, a lot of reactions, some mechanisms, but I promise this is definitely the most interesting, fun stuff in OCHEM 1. So, get ready.